Defensively, he's not tasked with a ton. I'll be interested to see if that role expands at all, Parrish. But he was actually the most efficient player on the team last year among you know the regulars in the roster. He had a 120.50 rating, according to Kempom. That was the most efficient clip of any serious minutes getter, getter there. So, yes, they bring four of their the best, you know, the best five back. They get Puff Johnson back, which is uh, which is big. Seth Trimble's a name to know as a freshman. Uh, there's a lot to like here, and you know we see what uh, Carolina can do with a different set of pressures in year two under Hubert Davis. Last year, you know, it was a different scenario altogether. They struggled against really good teams. They blew out bad teams, and they finally got it together, and they went on a memorable run. I mean, what Davis did in year one is just unbelievable, and now uh, they set up here in a spot where this program and this fan base is, is very accustomed to being, as we mentioned before, preseason, number one level kind of team, final four aspirations, national championship aspirations. Things are going just fine so far in Hubert Davis's tenure. I think everything you just said is kind of connected to each other. Um, in, in, in the sense that Carolina started off bad. You know, they were they were eight and three after a 29 point loss to Kentucky and Las Vegas in the CBS Sports Classic. Like they weren't, if you remember, we're supposed to have four teams there, the other two being Ohio State, UCLA. UNC and Kentucky were not supposed to play each other. They were supposed to play, I think, Kentucky. It was, I think, it was Kentucky, UCLA, uh, UNC, yeah. Ohio State. COVID knocks out Ohio State, knocks out UCLA. So they just get together. This doubleheader featuring four teams turns into, I think we called it a single header. Mm -hmm. uh, North Carolina and Kentucky agreed to play each other, even though they weren't supposed to. And Carolina didn't even compete. It was embarrassing. Like it was an embarrassing loss. And people started asking big questions about Hubert, the direction of the program, fairly or unfairly. These conversations were happening. You know, fast forward a little bit, they, they get blown out at Wake Forest. So now they're 12 and six overall four and three in the ACC and fast forward a little bit. Five of their first eight losses were by double digits. They had five losses on the season by at least 17 points. They were getting walloped. Um, and then I think the real low point, they, they lose to Pitt at home on February 16th. And that dropped them to 18 and eight overall 10 and five in the ACC 49th at Ken Palm. And according to most on the, on the wrong side of the bubble at that moment, or at the very least in real danger of missing the NCAA tournament. But as the season progressed, you mentioned RJ Davis, Caleb Love. It's not an accident that they both got better as the season progressed because their roles were more identified um, as the season progressed. For much of the season, they were sharing point guard duties. But as the season grew deeper, and I give Hubert and that staff a lot of credit for this, they basically put the ball in RJ's hands and told Caleb Love, they just freed him up, moved him off the ball, and said, go be a scorer. And he was able to, to you know, not have to worry about some of the things that you have to worry about when you're a primary ball handler. You know, getting others involved, getting us into our this and that. He just go, hey, go score. And he became one of the most in incredible scorers in college basketball. He got 30 against UCLA in the Sweet 16. 27 of those came in the second half. Uh, he, he, he was bad in the national championship game. Uh, five of 24 from the field, one of eight from three. But in the final four games of the season, and I think you're going to find out this is going to be more of his role in this upcoming season, he was largely just a scorer. He averaged 21 shots per game in the final four games of the season and became, even though Baycott ended up averaging more points per game on the season, Caleb Love was their biggest scorer down the stretch. And I think that's largely what he'll be asked to do in this upcoming season. They figured it out as last season progressed. Now they enter this season with clearly defined roles. Like RJ Davis knows who he is and what he's supposed to do. Caleb Love now knows who he is and what he's supposed to do. Leaky Black, God bless him, knows what he is and what he's supposed to do. And Baycott knows what he is and what he's supposed to do. And what he is, by the way, and I don't um, – I, I guess I realize this, but it certainly doesn't get talked about enough, I don't think. People talk about Oscar Shibwe like he had this incredible, like statistical incredible season. And he did. He averaged 17 points and 15 rebounds per game. But Baycott got 16 and 13. I mean, Sheepway, runaway national player of the year and averaged one more point and two more rebounds per game than, 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 uh, than Armando Baycott. 
So Baycott was similarly statistically awesome, uh, just not quite as. I mean, that's why uh, it makes sense to me that Baycott would finish top three in our who's going to be the best player in college basketball uh, poll that we conducted with the Cannon Coaches Series because he was one of the very best last season. So I re- like when you bring back four or five starters from a team that was really good and they all have clearly defined roles, I mean, that is a great place to start the season. Not even Gonzaga, which I have number one, or Houston, which you know is a betting market favorite with the Zags, have that many clearly defined roles heading into the season. And then the question becomes Pete Nance. Um, I don't know that he's Brady Manic, but he did shoot 45% from three on 3.1 attempts per game last season at Northwestern. Now, you know, Manic was 40% from three on 6.2 attempts per game. So Manic was a little more high volume than what Pete Nance has been. But but I, I thought the staff was real smart. They, they recognized what Brady Manic brought to that team in terms of spacing and everything else. And they said, let's go find somebody who can theoretically do the same things. And, and they, they, they found him. And, yeah, I think Carolina is going to be really good. And I know that, because I've heard it all off season, uh, some people think that this is just a team that got hot in the tournament. That's not what this was. They got hot well before the tournament to the extent that they got hot. And I actually think to say they got hot is to discount what they did. They didn't get hot. They got great. They didn't get hot. They got – Just grew up. They grew up, man. I was yeah. sitting there literally courtside, final – K home game. I mean, that was the most impressive team performance. I think I watched the entire season, regardless, regular season, postseason. Like right. what Carolina did in that 40 minutes and how it adapted to that environment, just an insane, one of a kind, can't be replicated type of environment where everyone presumed it was just going to be a Duke walkover and they just blow the doors off, running away, winning that game. And no, they did not win the ACC auto bid. They got upended by Virginia Tech, I believe. I was there as well for that. Mm-hmm. So they did get they did get bumped again. But still, uh, if you really take the few games before the Duke win in the regular season and extend it into the tournament, uh, I would agree. They didn't get hot. They really just grew up, found themselves, and really found the form. They might have exceeded a little bit of what we thought Carolina could be you know, back in mid-December when we were trying to figure out what the hell was going on and why why things weren't clicking the way we thought they would. Yeah, like getting hot is VCU going to the Final Four. Yeah. That was getting hot because if you go back and look at the numbers, I can't remember them off the top of my head, but that VCU team, like, were making threes at an abnormally high rate in the tournament, like shooting it in a way they'd literally not yes. done hardly at all in the regular season. That's getting hot. It's an incredible achievement, but we can reasonably – and respectfully say that team just got hot in the bracket. North Carolina didn't get hot. They got good. If you go back to February 16th, after they fell to um, 18 and eight overall, 10 and five in the ACC and 49th at Ken Palm. From there, they went 11 next 12. Beat Duke twice, Virginia Tech, Baylor, UCLA, Marquette. From 217 through the end of the season, North Carolina ranked third in the country at BartTorvik.com behind only Kansas, the national champion, and Tech Tech. That's a pretty significant sample size. That's that's a little less than eight-week span. It's a span of 13 games. They played 39 games. So that's 33% of their schedule. They played 33% of their schedule at an extremely high rate as one of the three best teams in the country. Uh, they rank fifth in adjusted defensive efficiency in that stretch. And now they're bringing four of the five starters back from that team. I, like I said, I've got Gonzaga number one in the top 25 and one. But if AP voters want to make it North Carolina, you'll get no argument from me. It's an easy case to make. Just want to see Love be more efficient. He was a 36% shooter from three. Acceptable enough. Only 38% from two. His O rating was 101.5. That's got to improve. Uh, and I think that it, it will. And then the question becomes, with all this returning talent, uh, UNC was not a deep team last season. There is an there's an an, an understanding that it could be deeper though. Uh, Trimble will be good. They got another freshman, Jalen Washington. Buff, Puff Johnson will definitely uh, the younger brother, Cam Johnson. He'll definitely get more minutes. Dontre Styles, I would think, will get more minutes. Um, I don't know. I, I would just keep an eye on that. Demarco Dunn is another name to know. I don't think Carolina will be as thin uh i don't think it'll be a 60 deep team i'd be shocked if that was the case i really think there's a chance it might be nine deep and that might be the the key to it winning the acc this is a reasonable favorite to win its league 
And there's a, there's a lot to like here. And, you know, big picture, a, a lot of people are going to listen to this episode. You're Carolina fans, so you're deeply familiar with it. But from a broad perspective, uh, this is very good for college basketball. It's Carolina. Baycott's a preseason All-American. He, you know, six double-doubles. What's an NCAA tournament record? Six double-doubles uh, getting Carolina to a title game. You have familiar faces. Caleb Love. That's actually very, very good uh, for the sport in general. 